In this architectural photography Lightroom tutorial, I'm going to share with you how we can utilize range masks to take a single frame raw architectural photo from something like this to something like this. Range masks are a really time efficient way to edit your photos. And although I'm demonstrating how to use them on architectural photography here, the techniques are universal and will apply to all genres of photography. So let's get into it. There is a large gym complex being built near me. I've been hired to capture the space, but currently it's not quite finished yet. So I've just got some overall shots that the council can actually use for their marketing. And at this stage of the process, all I'm doing is getting the photos looking good enough to go back to the client so that they can actually pick which photos they want me to finesse and just digitally enhance and make look really good. So initially I wanna be spending the minimum amount of time on these photos. If we look at this shot of the entranceway here, you can see that I've got a very similar shot here, which is completely unedited. This is the raw version. So I thought this would be a good example to show you guys how range masking works inside of Lightroom. If the client were to select this particular photo, then this isn't the approach I would be taking because I've actually got five different photos that I could be working with, with different exposures. So I'd be actually using exposure blending or loading these photos into Aurora HDR. So I'll be taking the best of my bracketed images. So for example, I may be using this orange area here from this photo. I may be using the sky from this particular photo. But for my initial edit, I don't want to be wasting time on an image that I'm not actually going to be being paid for. If you guys are interested in my pricing model, I've discussed that in several of my other architectural videos, so I won't go into it here. But what I'll do here is show you quickly what I do to get this photo looking pretty good. And normally that's done with an initial import preset, but I'll show you how I do that from the ground up. And then I'll show you how we can take it just a little bit further and leverage that range masking. So first things first, we'll choose a camera matching profile and I normally go for a flat profile. And straight away you'll see that gives us a little bit more depth and information in the shadows and the highlights. So that's a really good place to start. From there, what I like to do is create a pretty crude HDR version. So I'm going to drop the highlights down. I boost the shadows up and then we start to get all of that detail back in there. And I would never normally be being this crude with um, pushing my sliders that far, because as you guys know, if you're boosting up the shadow detail from quite a dark exposure, when you look into that shadow detail, you'll see a lot of noise. Whereas if I was to use a brighter file like this, we have much less noise because it was actually exposed more correctly for this area in the first place. But for the low res proof that I'm going to be sending back to my client, this single frame will do just fine. The red warnings here and the blue warnings here are just warnings to represent where my shadows are getting too dark and going beyond black or my highlights are going beyond white. You can either leave those on so that you can have that visual warning very clear or just keep an eye on the histogram. That's another way just to see if you're blowing out to pure white. The fact that we're at white at the moment right through here, I'm not worried about that because that's where we're going to use the range masking to control that. I like to add a bit of clarity into my file more than I would for my normal finished version and sometimes a little bit of dehaze as well but basically I build all of this into a preset so this is applied straight away when these photos are imported I'll normally pop the vibrance and saturation up just ever so slightly as well and my tone curve is normally just boosting up the shadows mid-tones and then just protecting the highlights one of the most important things to have sorted is to have your enable profile corrections ticked and you can see straight away as I turn that off and on it's not making a huge difference for this particular shot um, because I'm at 27 millimeters and that is somewhere between when I get a barrel distortion at the very wide end of this zoom lens or I get a bit of pin cushioning when I zoom in on this lens. So we kind of in that Goldilocks sweet spot where everything's just right. There's not actually too much of a correction going on at the moment, but that is so important to make sure that that is checked. The proof image that I send through to my client is a lower res version. So I don't actually need to add any sharpening during that stage of the editing process, but just so we've got a nice bit of uh, sharpness just to deal with here, I'll just add a little bit there. And normally if I am adding sharpening, I need to counteract that just with a little bit of luminance noise reduction. Now, one of the most unforgivable things as a photographer when you're sending your work back to your clients for architectural real estate is if you haven't actually corrected for perspective distortion. So at the moment, we've got some keystoning going on here where all the vertical lines are converging up towards the top. We want to make sure they're nice and straight. And my favorite way to do that is use the guided tool within inside of the transform drop, back, drop down box there. 
and we just draw one line down on the right hand side and then we do the same on the left hand side. The closer you can put your lines towards the edge of the frame, the more accurate this correction is going to be. If you haven't quite nailed your horizon line, you can also uh, put a line across just to make sure that that's as it should be. Okay, if I close that down, I'm just gonna use the backslash key to show us our before and our after. So to get this image from this to this, normally all I would have done is import my photo with those changes that I showed you here set as a preset. And then really the only manual things that I would normally be doing is potentially adjusting the white balance if I need to and just correcting the geometry using that guided tool. Sometimes you can get away just by clicking the vertical and sometimes Lightroom can figure it out and do a pretty good job, but I've found it's not always that accurate and you're better off actually doing it yourself. Righty ho, let's get onto the range masking. So in order to do range masking, we actually need to make some local adjustments. So what I want to do here is darken down the sky, perhaps saturate it a little bit, just make that sky a little bit more interesting. I'd also like to boost up the shadow detail through here and potentially cancel out the blue color cast that's coming in here and just washing out the orange. It's a very vibrant orange when you're there and you see this in real life. You can probably see it a little better in this exposure, but to your eye, it looks very, very vibrant and orange. So I want to bring back that orange there. So I'll be able to do that. And potentially we might want to just brighten up this little area here, just so it looks a little bit more inviting coming into the entranceway of the gym complex. If you want to be quite precise with your masking, we can use the brush tool and actually brush any changes in. But what I prefer to do, particularly when I'm working on these proofs, and one of my main goals is to get the photo looking as acceptably good as I can, but in as quick a time as I possibly can. So what I like to opt for usually is the radial filter. So what I'd do to darken down the sky here is I'll just click in the widest part through here and now I'm gonna bring this out, I let go, and then what I'm gonna do is grab this point here and just rotate it so that we're kind of covering over the sky as best we can. Now we can come in and we can darken that down and straight away we're bringing back all of that wonderful sky detail. Obviously we're shooting raw so that data exists inside the file. If you're shooting JPEG, that um, isn't gonna magically bring back blown out highlights. And because I thought that evening sky here was quite an important part of this particular image, that's why I selected this particular photo from the bracketed set, rather than going for one of the other frames where the actual building itself was better exposed. I wanted to make sure that we had that information here in this file for the sky. But at the same time, I've still got the information for the building. As well as dropping the exposure, let's see what else we can do. Just bring the highlights down a little bit. And let's play with the color balance as well. That's quite nice when we boost that up just slightly, just warm the temperature up. And let's put more of an evening magenta tint into that as well. Now, one thing I like about working with radial filters is that if you set the feather to just drop off from that center point, and if I press O, you can see the actual mask that I'm dealing with here. Rather than being a very hard edge, where if you've got no feather, or I think Lightroom's default is 50, I actually have this set just slightly higher, around that sort of 70, 75% mark. And then we get a nice fall off from the center. And so sometimes I don't even worry about applying range masks to control this mask more accurately. I feel like it's got enough of a feather off, enough of a smooth transition that it's going to be passable during this proofing stage. But let's say you wanna be a little bit more accurate and do a better job of this. We're gonna come into the range mask and you can see we can either choose color or luminance. So obviously luminance is working on the brightness of the photo. So we could use luminance as an option because obviously all of this sky area is much brighter than the building and the foreground. But an equally valid choice for us here would be color. So I'm gonna use the color option here and all we need to do is choose the eyedropper tool here and rather than just clicking on one point, say the blue here, which is gonna say only show this mask in this blue area here, I'm just gonna press Control Z to undo that. What I prefer to do is actually select a range of color. So what I'm gonna do is click and drag a box down into the oranges. And then when I release, so far we've got all of that section of the sky there. And you will have seen that it removed the effect of this uh, radial adjustment that we've made. It's removed it from the building. But you can see that it hasn't applied that change along the horizon line here. So if you want to add to the range mask itself, you just press shift 
And now we've got that little plus icon and now we can draw another box if we want. And now we're including more colors. As you would have seen by including this more washed out and gray area here, because that hue exists within the building a little bit, it allowed the effect to bleed over just a little bit into the building. To fine tune your range mask further if you want to, you can play with the amount slider here. And you can see that as I move this to the right, we're getting more of a feathered effect. As I move it to the left, it's masking with more precision around what I selected before. So now it's not including this little bit, so I can add that in as well. And I'm not a big fan of a hard edge like this with your masks, so we'll just increase that range amount ever so slightly. And now with a little toggle switch in the bottom left corner, we can look at our before and our after. Before, kind of blown out sky, not much detail or interest in the colors there. Toggle it on, ooh, lovely rich evening sky. Okay, let's do another one. So I'm just gonna click and drag, and we're gonna brighten up the area up the top here. So I've made a really big radial mask, and you can see as I grab the exposure, we're obviously brightening that area or darkening it, and we want to brighten that up. And I'm gonna use a little bit of a combo between boosting the exposure up and then also grabbing the shadows and bringing those up as well. If things start to get a little washed out, you can actually bring the blacks down slightly, and if you want, you can also bring the whites up just to add a little bit more contrast in there as well. And rather counterintuitively, what you can do is actually reduce the contrast with the contrast slider, and that actually brings out more detail in the very dark shadows. This is one of those times where usually I'd just let the feathering of this radial mask just do its job, and I wouldn't even worry about a range mask. But if we wanted to, what we can do is, again, come into the color section, grab the range selector tool here, and then we can just drag that over the orange. And there you go, we've brightened up just those shadowy orange areas. And now we can toggle this off and on and see what both of those local masks are doing for us. The neat thing with the range masks is we're controlling the effect of this radial filter, but we can also add to it as well. So I'm just gonna take this a little further into these oranges as well. To bring out more of that orange there, what we can also do is grab the temperature slider and just push that to the right. And by doing that, we're just canceling out some of that blue cast that's leaking in and illuminating underneath here. I'll add another radial mask just down here on the floor, and I'm just gonna brighten up this area here. And normally when I'm working with this tool, that's how quickly I do it. I just grab it, place it, pull it out, and make my adjustment done, move on. So far we've just looked at the color range mask, but I need to show you guys the luminosity version of it. So let's do that. I'm going to place another radial mask here, and we're gonna control the sky element in the reflection. We want to match the color, and I can do that by bringing the tint up slightly, bring the temperature up as well. And normally the reflection of something is never quite as bright as the actual thing it's reflecting. So I'm just gonna drop the exposure down slightly. I think we might want to add a little bit of saturation so we're not muddying that out too much. And again, we could just let the fall off of the feathering just take care of this and not even worry about a range mask, but we're gonna be more precise here. So let's come into the luminance section here. So as you guys know, luminance is just talking about the brightness. So we can say, apply this mask, but only in the shadows or the highlights. And the way we do that is by grabbing these little nubbies right here. And yes, that's the technical term for them. And as we take the left nubby, which represents the shadows, as we bring that up, we're saying, anything that falls below this point no longer affect that area. So anything that's below that point, so shadows basically, if I bring that up, that's representing 50% gray or thereabouts when you get to 50. And so anything that's darker than a mid gray, it's not applying this change to anymore. Look, let me push this down a little darker so that we can actually see this a little better. And I'm gonna grab that slider. And as I take it back down, it's then darkening those shadows. But as I bring it up, you watch the shadows it's no longer affecting those shadows. So as I bring this into that area, you'll see that it darkens the sky because that's the brightest part, but it's not actually making any changes to those shadows anymore. You can see as I hover over this and we see in red the actual mask itself that we still have a little bit of bleed going on and that is controlled by that smoothness slider. So I'm gonna press O on the keyboard so that we see the mask, not the changes that are being made. And now when I change the smoothness slider, you can see at 100 again, it's feathering out, almost annulling what we actually did with this range mask. And as I take it to the left, 
it creates a super precise mask just around those bright areas that we defined by moving this slider up. And let me just move this slider again so that you can now see while we see the mask itself, just how this range mask is actually affecting the mask. So if we put it around that 70 mark, you can see that we are pretty much precisely just controlling that sky. If I press O again, we'll just see that has darkened down the sky. That is our change that we've made just in that little area there. So this level of precision that we can get to just by adding a range mask and either working with the luminance, the brightness values, and selecting the color range that we want the effect to apply to, we actually have a lot of control here. So if you're not working with a bracketed set and you're just working on a single exposure, this tool can be really useful. As we've brightened up this shadow area and brought down the brightness value of the sky itself, looking at the histogram, we can see that we've actually lost a little bit of contrast. We're not pushing out to full white. So we can go back and just refine this a little further. I can pop in a little bit more contrast there and perhaps boost the exposure up. There we go, let's have a look at our before and look at our after. What a huge change we've made there. The benefit of working with range mask is it's pretty effective and it's really quick. For real estate photography, this may be all you need to get finished imagery back to your client. But if you're working for an architect and you're doing architectural photography, the finished image should be of a higher quality than what we've produced here. This approach is just time efficient. If you want to learn more about how to create a more high-end and bespoke version of this, the last video that I created looks at exposure blending in Photoshop, the best way to approach that, and also a couple of tools for finishing your images and take your work up to that next level where you can actually start demanding more money for your work. I hope this has been helpful to you guys. Let me know what you thought in the comments. And as always, help me out with a thumbs up on the video. It means a lot to me. And if you'd like to learn more about photo editing, architectural photography, all of that good stuff, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.